the artwork behind me is by a famous science fiction artist, just Frank Kelly Frias. It's from a long defunct pulp magazine. It's one I'd never even heard of. Um, I was going to talk about pulp magazines at length in this, and then it struck me a lot of pulp magazines are connected to science fiction. So I thought, for something of a giggle, I'd have co-pilot one of the wonderful worlds of chat GDP and similar programs actually write me a miniature script because it seemed to tie in quite nicely. That's something that the people who wrote pulp magazines for sort of an extent, you'll find quite a lot of science fiction writers like Ray Bradbury or Frederick Pohl or Paul Anderson and people like that writing about the possible consequences of sort of, um, AI and how it will be used, sometimes in the most mind-bending ways. Philip K. Dick is a particular example of that, where these stories are so mind-bending, you can't decide what's going on somewhere at times. But in any way, case, this is what Copilot churned out. Now, I'd be the first to point out that Copilot and ChatGDP often churn out the most amazingly inaccurate junk as well. This, however is reasonably accurate because I do know about this subject. Um, I would, however, point out that don't use ChatGB to try and summarise books. It's disastrous for that. Copilot, Pulp Magazines, a distinctive chapter in publishing history, began in the late 19th century and thrived until the mid-20th century. Here's a brief history. Origins, the era of Pulp Magazines dawned with Frank Munsey's transformation of Argosy, in 1896 into an all-fiction periodical printed on cheap wood pulp paper, hence the term pulp. And this is why if you ever buy old pulp magazines, the paper is often turned to yellow, sort of uh, almost crumbly dust. And it's why they're becoming increasingly sort of rare, the older magazines, and have to be stored in particular ways. The paper is basically becoming... Um, the amount of acid in the paper from that production is basically turning the paper into unreadable junk. This move marked a shift from the earlier dime novels and story of papers, ordering affordable entertainment to the masses. Golden ages, the pulps flourished, peaking in popularity between the 1920s and 1950s. Yes, indeed. This is where you get the writers it mentions below. They were known for their sensational and sometimes lurid, lurid stories spanning genres from romance and detective tales to science fiction adventure. The magazines were a breeding ground for iconic characters like The Shadow, who is basically the forerunner of Batman, although a very much more violent character, where Doc Savage and Tarzan, and helped launch the careers of notable authors such as H.P. Lovecraft, Dashiell Hammett, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. And also, if we want to mention some other people, people like Robert E. Howard, Leigh Brackett, C.L. Moore, Ray Bradbury, you can keep going on and on. Decline. The decline of pulps began during World War II, exacerbated by paper shortages and changing consumer tastes. The rise of comic books, television and paperback books further eroded their popularity, leading to the end of the traditional pulp magazine era by the 1950s. I'd say of those three, paperback books probably did the most damage. If you look on the cover of this magazine behind me, where you can... In the original file I took it from, you can see the price is 35 cents. That was equivalent to the price for paperback book back in the era it was meant, printed in. And you would get a lot more material in a paperback book. On the plus side, in a pulp magazine, you'd get several stories, but they were often shorter or episodic, and you'd often get a heck of a lot of advertising in there. Legacy, despite their demise, the influence of pulp magazines endure. They paved the way for modern genre fiction and contributed significantly to the development of popular culture. Today, the term pulp fiction is still used to describe a certain type of fast plot, phase plot driven storytelling, and a particular movie that I'm sure we're all familiar with, where people go on about burgers. This condensed history captures the essence of pulp magazines, a medium that entertained millions and an effort in indelible mark and literature and art. That shows how, by the way, you can actually use AI to get something useful, although it's best used with caution because although that's a nice potted summary, it's not very in-depth. But 
Moving on to a more in-depth summary of it, I found this site when doing it, and when that bar from Zoom disappears up the top in a moment, which it will do, we'll have a look. Off you go then. First, here's something that's famous from Pulps, and it's Theodore Sturgeon's Law. It's an adjunct that states 90% of everything is crap. It has precursors in literature. Roger Kipling's famous precursor uh, is mentioned down in the body of this Wikipedia article. Four fifths of everybody's work must be bad, but the remnant is worth the trouble for its own sake. And it's inevitably true. It's art as product, Pulp Fiction. You can see it from this magazine on the right. What do we see here? We see a, a blonde girl in a red skimpy dress. There's a guy who's out of sight holding a, an automatic pistol, possibly a laser gun. You can't really be sure unless you read this story. And we have some monsters that look like sort of Frankensteinian or a zombie fight in the background. It's designed to get somebody seeing that on a spinner to pick it up and go, oh, what's going on there and read it. Even nowadays, basically, that's how most popular fiction works. It wants you to make you pick it up and read it. It's product. Nothing wrong with that if we sell high-quality product. The art on this cover, in fact, is reasonably well executed. Most Pulp Fiction art covers are. There's a load of well-known artists who are involved in this sort of stuff. You have Virgil Finlay. You have loads of other artists who are actually well known enough to have had exhibition stage of their work and you'll find galleries of their work. But coming back to that, here's the Pulp Magazine Project, an archive of all fiction pulp magazines from 1896 to 1946. And you'll see an example of famous pulp magazines at the back. You've got Black Mask, which is a very famous magazine. That cover of Amazing Stories with... Um, ships marooned on mountains underneath an orbiting planet that appears to be Saturn is a very famous cover as well. You've got the All Story magazine, which is an early magazine, which has a rather boring cover by today's standards. Wonder Stories there with that um, UFO beaming down death rays. That's another famous cover. Um, this is a very famous archive, and you can download thousands and thousands of magazines from it. And it's quite good as a research tool as well. And it's quite good if you just want something to read. Now, I am not going to argue that every pulp magazine ever produced was particularly of literary value. Many of them are not. There's quite a lot of junk in there that adheres to Sturgeon's Law. And he's unreadable. It was pulp magazines were basically worked on the premise that the writers were writing for basically a small amount of money and churning out a certain amount of words to be for that money. And they really were churning it out when you look at the kind of money, amount of words they were supposed to churn out. In Frederick Pohl is infamous for having raised the pay rate from them from one cent a word to two cents, which just about allowed people to make a living out of this. Now, you're now going to get the joy of looking through my Kindle library where there's quite a lot of pulp writers in there i'm going to pull a few of them out a few of the more famous ones we're going to start with perhaps one of the most famous pulp writers which is howard the creator of conan when i type his name in that is let's pull him out there we go um conan is of course one of the most infamous pulp characters who still held on to his popularity. I don't know how many people actually read the original material and the original material has had its own ups and downs with controversies with arguments about eugenics and race and all sorts. It's definitely in there. You can't get away with it. Um, I, wouldn't, I would say that on the other side of the coin there was a certain particular melancholic wistful tone that, and tone of antiquity and longing and regret that's worth reading in Howard, but you can't get away with the fact that Howard definitely has particular ideas about race. 
you can throw him the lifeline of he's a product of his generation, but it only goes so far. But in any case, this is Beyond the Black River, one of the most famous Conan stories. Chapter one, Conan loses his axe. The stillness of the forest tale was so primeval that the thread of a soft-booted foot was a startling disturbance. At least it seemed so to the ears of the wayfarer, that he was moving along the path with a caution that must be practised by any man who ventures beyond Thunder River. This is a sort of typical opening you'll get with Pulp Fiction, although Howard is rather a master at it. He's stuck you in a forest. There's a sense of tension. You don't know what's going to happen next. And he's setting up sort of a, an adventure story in as few uh, words as possible. He was a young man of medium height with an open countenance and a mop of tousled tiny hair, unconfined with a cap or helmet. We know straight away it's not Conan because regular readers of Conan, of course, knew that Conan was always described as a bronze giant with black square cut hair. His garb was common enough for that country, a coarse tunic belted at the waist, short leather breeches beneath and soft buckskin boots that came short of the knee. A knife hill jutted from one boot top. So we know that he's probably a forester. He's equipped with, he's familiar with weapons. Again, you can see that Howard is quite, is loading as much description as, as he can into the first few paragraphs. These guys wanted to do that. They weren't interested in literary experiments, although some of them managed to do quite a bit of experimenting with style regardless and, and, and break the um, conventions of the, of the genre. But, it's not that common. There was no perturbation in the wide eyes that scanned the green walls which the fringe the trial. Though not tall, he was well built, and the arms at the short, wide sleeves of the tunic left bare were thick with cord and muscle. This particular code and story is basically, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I only wanted to read the opening to give an idea of the sort of feel of one of these stories. Is based in with um a model of colonialism where the kingdom that Conan works for is trying to build a series of forts behind Honda River where the Picts are a constant threat. You could view it as almost um, a sort of the Old West transported into a fantasy theme. Eventually ends in disaster. And if I keep scrolling forward in this wonderful free version from Kindle, We'll eventually get to the end of the story, and you'll see that um, they come to the conclusion that barbarism is the natural root of mankind. Let's use a search for that, rather than me scrolling like that. Most of Howard's stories are particularly gloomy and tend to end in particularly gloomerism gloomy ways they don't particularly end in a nice way they always tend to end with a, a view that barbarism is what man reverts to oh there we go barbarism is a natural state of mankind the borderer said still staring somberly at the Sumerian civilization is unnatural is a whim of circumstance and barbarism must ultimately triumph now, that's kind of um, Howard's own point of view tending to interfere. I don't tend to absolutely agree with this. Howard was a very young man when he died, unfortunately, by suicide. And I've always thought, tend to think that he had rather cynical and rather views that hadn't matured yet with age. But let's have some other pulp writers. There's some more st stored in there among the millions of other things in there. There's Black Amazon of Mars with another typical comic, comic book style cover, almost of a, a fierce of Amazon swinging a, a, an improbably large axe. Leigh Brackett is also quite famous in another way because she's connected with the Star Wars mythos, although not everyone who watches it realises it. She was one of the people who wrote the an early draft for The Empire Strikes Back. Black Amazon of Mars, through all the long, cold hours of the northern night, the Martian had not moved or spoken. 
At dusk of the day before Eric John Stark had brought him into the Urin Tower and laid him down, wrapped in blankets on the slow. He had built a fire of dread bush, and since then the two men had waited a load of the vast island that girdles the polar cap of Mars. This sort of um, habitable Mars, a habitable Venus, is a very common theme. You'll find it in Edgar Rice Burroughs, most famously, with his whole John Carter of Mars series, where it's full of a romanticised Mars with chivalrous sort of warriors fighting for fair maidens on a dying planet. Lay Brackett, it must be said to be fair, actually breaks quite a lot of conventions. She works black heroes in in a roundabout way when people don't actually notice it when they're reading. She does it in such a subtle way because she doesn't really refer to it until they're quite a long way into the text and then they'll just keep reading, which people have referred to when writing about her. And then there's C.L. Moore, another female writer. And there are quite a lot of female writers in the pulp tradition, some of whom were wrote under male names, mainly because they knew that the readers of this sort of stuff were really expecting to sort of get two-fisted tales of vengeance and justice and whatnot. I'm going to pick C.L. Moore here because C.L. Moore is basically, again, in a roundabout way connected with the um, Star Wars mythos, her character in this story, North um, Smith, Northwest Smith, is basically Han Solo. Anyone who reads her stuff can basically see that it's it's Han Solo, and that who and that uh, George Lucas basically borrowed the basic idea. There's no real problem in that because George Lucas has admitted his own death to this sort of material. This is probably the most famous story in that um, sequence, Shamblo, and it's particularly famous as a science fiction tale. Anyway, I'll read out the whole of the first page. Man has conquered space before. You may be sure of that. Somewhere beyond the Egyptians, in that dimness out of which comes echoes of half-mythical names, Atlantis, Mew, somewhere back of history's first beginnings, there must have been an age when mankind, like us today, built cities of steel to house its star-roving ships and knew the names of the planets in their own native tongues, haired Venus as people call their wet world, Shadol, in that soft, sweet, slurring speech and mimicked Mars guttering, like this, from the harsh tongues of Mars dryland dwellers. You may be sure of it. Man has conquered space before, and out of that conquest, faint echoes run still through a world that has forgotten the very fact of a civilization which must have been as mighty as our own. There have been too many myths and legends for us to doubt it. The myth of the Medusa, for instance, can never had its root in the souls of Earth. That tale of the snake-haired Garg Gorgon, whose gaze turned towards the ga gaze of the stone, never originated about any creature that Earth nourished. This is a particularly creepy and odd tale that is well worth a read and is quite famous on its own. It's actually been written about by quite a number of academics because of the strange sexual tensions and weird interactions going on underneath it. Um, coming back to Sturgeon and his wonderful view of this sort of stuff, to end this, I'd say, like, that if you were going to approach Pulp Fiction... Your best bet is not to buy all these old magazines. One, they would cost you a fortune. Two, due to the fact that they're mostly decayed and are turning into dust, you're far better to approach something like that site where it's trying to store them in digitised form and just pick what you want to read. You'll see the kind of roots of characters like Batman, Superman, all the characters you see in the superhero movies that are now part of our popular culture. There are equivalent of pulp fiction for the 21st century. We may think this is all old junk that uh, only grandads from the 1930s who may still be alive remember, but we're actually still influenced by it, whether we like it or not. We're carrying on that sort of literary tradition. And that character behind us on the cover of that pulp ma magazine by Frank Kelly Frias could quite easily be drawn on the front of a, a box art for a PC game nowadays, if you think about it. 
she'd fit quite nicely. She'd work quite nicely in that context. All art is essentially moving symbols about, and that's what Pulp Fiction was at its best, just like any other literary form.